Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. It's great to be here in Hartsup Memorial Hall, the Grand Army of the Republic. I'd like to dedicate tonight's lecture to two people. Uh, first of all, the late meteorologist Don Kent, and to General George Hartsup. General, thank you for allowing me to use your present uh, your your building here today. Special thanks goes out to the Rockland Historical Commission and the Hartsup Memorial Association for having me here in this <coughs> fine town of Rockland. Well, tonight we're going to talk about one of my most popular lectures, the Great Hurricane of 1938. I've been called a lot of things, some that I can't say in public, but uh, historical raconteur, New England folklorist. One of my passions is historical meteorology. And uh, if we look back at what's been called the Long Island Express GH38, it's the last great hurricane to strike New England. I'm also into historical astronomy. And I must say, uh, going into this talk, we're in very strange times indeed. I can't pronounce the name of the volcano in Iceland. I call it Ike or Big E. But uh, there are some eerie parallels with what's going on today with our weather, um, uh, mainly a volcano going off and a lack of sunspot activity that parallels with the year without a summer, another lecture um, that I do, which dropped worldwide global temperatures. And then the other strange thing is Heather Locklear is back behind the wheel, which scares all of us. <laughs> I'm also a professional sports announcer, so if I break out into a hockey announcer's voice, I'm an announcer for the Boston Bruins alumni, 18 years, and I'm the New England Patriots basketball announcer, if you can comprehend that. So. No. Uh, rules of engagement, cell phones off, please. Usually when I say that, my wife calls me. Mine's still on, so um, restrooms right over here in case of fire straight off the back wall of the exit signs. And of course the expert role, and it certainly applies here, although I'm a bit disappointed because I don't see anybody in the room tonight that was around in 1938. You're all too young for me. Um, but uh, there's usually someone in the room uh, who knows more about the subject than I do, and someone who thinks that they know more about the subject than I do. But of course, in this case, most of you, if you've experienced it, I want to hear about your personal recollections at the conclusion of tonight's talk. So we're going to talk about the, uh, what is a hurricane, take a snapshot of the uh, GH38 and some of the factoids, a uh, history of North Atlantic hurricanes, we're going to look at the other two great hurricanes in addition to the great hurricane of 1938, that's the great colonial hurricane of 1635 and the great September gale of 1815, uh, we'll look at the track of the hurricane, the summer of 38, a muffed forecast, a record low air pressure, they're insane some of these numbers you're going to see tonight. Uh, New York City, we're going to follow the path of the hurricane. New York City, Long Island, uh, Connecticut, the Great New London, New London Fire, Rhode Island. Uh, a couple of stories, personal stories, one I call Wedding Splashers, the Mary Poppins of Brent Rock. Uh, we'll briefly look at the Great Flood of 36, and then the battering of the Connecticut River Valley, the impact, and then the death of the monster. With this hurricane, you see acts of bravery and cowardice, acts of kindness and selfishness, Providence, luck, and cruel fate. Up until that time, this was the most costly disaster in U.S. history. It was a lateral buzzsaw, my term. Nobody was prepared because nobody was warned. There were unlikely heroes, and by the time this thing died out on September 28, 1938, 10 states and two countries were affected. Not to get into some hurricane talk, but you hear category one through category five. Um, basically, uh, category one, is wind speeds of uh, 75 miles per hour to, do I like this? Yeah, 74 miles per hour to 95 miles per hour, all the way up to a Cat 5, which is greater than 155 miles per hour, almost uh, incomprehensible. Storm surge, the reason why I bring this up, let me go back to that s slide. We're talking about a tropical depression with 23 to 39 miles per hour. We've had like, about how many of those? 10 already in the last six months. A tropical storm, 40 to 73 miles per hour. Well, the last major hit we had was Hurricane Bob of August of 1991. And that was just a hiccup next to the Great Hurricane of 1938. But it devastated the lower canal on the south coast of Massachusetts. It looked like F-16s moved in on sorties with some of the destruction in Wareham and Swiss Beach that I got to witness firsthand. Um, if you look at hurricane damage, you're talking about st storm surge. It's a dome of water 40 to 60 miles long that moves onto the shoreline near the landfall point of the eye. A cubic yard of seawater weighs approximately 1,700 pounds as this water is constantly slamming into shoreline structures. Even well-built structures quickly get demolished. 
As the waters move inland, more debris floats along with it, causing further damage. Storm surge is responsible for nearly 90% of all hurricane-related deaths and injuries. Fact, 1876, Bakagunj, India, 200,000 died, most, most of them drowned. Fact, 1881, Haiphong, China, 300,000 died. <clears throat> you also have wind damage. The force of wind can quickly decimate the tree population, down power lines and utility poles, knock over signs, and may be strong enough to destroy some homes and buildings. Flying debris can also cause damage, and in cases where people are caught outdoors, injuries and death. When hurricanes first make landfall, it's common for tornadoes to form, which can cause severe localized wind damage, and in most cases, however, wind is a secondary cause of damage. Storm surge is the primary cause. And then, of course, rainfall and flooding. Torrential rains that normally accompany a hurricane can cause serious flooding, whereas the storm surge and high winds are concentrated near the eye. The rain may extend for hundreds of miles and may last for several days, affecting areas well after the hurricane has diminished. And that's what you're going to see with this hurricane. Uh, it, it, it stalled over New England, and even though the winds dissipated, the rain came in torrents. If you look at the American coastline, very vulnerable. I mean, a great deal of the population runs from Boston down to Philadelphia, and uh, the population migrates towards the coast. It's the most sought after land. Here's one of my favorite slides of hurricanes. 100 years of hurricanes, 1886 to, 18, uh, to 1996. You can see they develop off the west coast of Africa, and they track uh, to, to the northwest, and then they hook uh, back out to the northeast. But you can see where the pattern where most hurricanes have cut right across the Gulf of Mexico. Of course, even England, Scotland uh, are vulnerable to hurricanes. Uh, GH38 dies out right here. And not many people realize, but Nova Scotia is in the path of hurricanes in the hookout to the northeast. If you look at intense New England hurricane strikes of antiquity, an analysis of sedimentary deposits reveal major hurricane strikes along the New England coast, 1100 to 1150, 1300 to 1400, 1400 to 1450, and of course Columbus came over, he lucked out when he crossed the Atlantic during hurricane season, he had a, a nice ride across. And then 1635, 1815, and then 1869, I call that Saxby's Gale, that should also be classified as a major hurricane. Mm -hmm. The Great Colonial Hurricane took place on August 16, 1635, that's the old Julian calendar date, and Governor John Winthrop said, quote, it blew with such violence with abundance of rain that it blew down many hundreds of trees, overthrew some houses, and drove ships from their anchors. The tide rose in Narragansett 14 feet higher than ordinary and drowned eight Indians flying from their wigwams. Uh, the ship Angel Gabriel was also destroyed with all hands lost, 21 souls lost. We know that the eye passed to the south and east of Boston, as did GH 38. And William Bradford, in Plymouth at the time, said, quote, it caused the sea to swell to the south wind of this place above 20 foot right up and down and made many of the Indians to climb into trees for their safety. Storm surge. It continued about five or six hours, but the violence began to abate. It blew down many hundreds of thousands of trees. The signs and marks of it will remain this hundred years in these parts. And he was right. And of course, they some attributed to an astronomical uh, phenomena, the moon suffered a great eclipse the second night after. 1815 was the Great September Gale, Saturday, September 23rd, 1815. How ironic is that that the Great Hurricane took place on September 21st, 1913? Noah Webster said, quote, the storm was a proper hurricane. It was one of several severe storms that struck North Atlantic shipping lanes that season, and it struck Long Island near Center Mauritius. Montauk Point Lighthouse was heavily damaged, and in the East River, wharves were underwater by three feet at 10 in the morning. The eye passes to the east of Hartford and Springfield, as did GH 38. Hampshire Gazette said it was a tornado of wind and rain. In Yale, in New, uh, New uh, Haven, Connecticut, six and a half inches of rain over two days. That's nothing compared to what we experienced in March. And New Haven Register said that it drifted several hogshead of rum and molasses from the wharf. Important supplies. In eastern Connecticut, all of Rhode Island, east central Massachusetts was raked. The rain had a salty flavor to it, and houses and trees had a white hue from the ocean froth. And the wind whipped 90-foot sprays from the Charles River. And I found two uncorroborated reports of a water spout on the Charles River during the Great September Gale of 1815. 